I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Winger. Jeff has been a support to us throughout the process, helping us um, assess the literature, do some very in-depth review, review of the uh, uh, material that exists out there, and also helping coordinate um, um, the model that we've now landed on. So, Jeff. Thanks, Matt. So I will use the mic. <laughs> Um, my job is to uh, kind of run you through the kind of process that we've been on in terms of the research that we've been gathering over the past couple of years. Um, it's been a kind of a, it's been an exciting journey. We started, as Matt mentioned, Matt, he touched on many of these issues, but we did a lot of work around what programs exist in the community right now, what kinds of things are working, where are they working, and what kinds of things can we build on. Um, and there are a lot, many of you are providing some of those programs. It was a real privilege to get to hear some of the exciting programs that are going on. We also heard from you in the neighborhood action work that the Community Foundation has been involved with, that education is a, is a big priority and skills training is a big priority, that that's something that residents are asking for and residents are asking for their kids. We've been out talking with a lot of you, so as I look around the room, I see a lot of faces that we've just been having conversations with about what can we do better, what can we do to serve the needs of kids in, the, in this community and, and bring the graduation rate and post-secondary attendance rates up even higher. Uh, Matt touched on some of the research partnerships that we've had. The, the, one of the most exciting uh, partnerships that we've had is with uh, Fiona Deller, who's not able to make it today, but she works with the Higher Education Populations and encouraging post secondary access programs across North America. So she was able to really bring uh, kind of a national and international perspective to what works in programs uh, all across North America. And that was really helpful when we were trying to identify the characteristics that you're going to hear about in a bit. And then, as Matt mentioned, the partnership with the Fairmount Foundation, both to help kind of carry out some of this work, but also as a uh, partner going, moving ahead, uh, will be really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the features of the program that we ended up with after conducting all of those conversations and research pieces. You will have seen most of this in the material that's on the web. Um, the goal, as Matt mentioned, is to improve high school graduation rates and access to post-secondary education, and we're defining that broadly. So that's, that's not just college, it's not just university, it really is a post-secondary path that results in uh, better work at the end of the day. Um, Abacus is focused on the middle school years, uh, grades 6, 7, 8, and the transition into grade 9. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment, um, but that is where the focus is going to be. Um, it's going to be based on the four, on four pillars of successful early intervention programs. So these are, these are pillars that were identified by Fiona in her research about what works um, in the national context and what are the characteristics of an early intervention program that really make a difference. And it's programs, it was interesting, it's, it's programs that offer all of these, or at least the participants have access to all of these that make programs the most effective. And they're uh, academic upskilling, we're going to talk about this more in a minute, uh, mentoring, goal setting, uh, and incentives. One of the other things um, that we found was that Hamilton is a really diverse uh, community, and there are a lot of different subpopulations. So when we talk about interventions that work, we recognize that we're going to have to tailor interventions to specific populations. What works with one group of folks is not necessarily going to work with another group of folks. Um, and in terms of post-secondary attendance, some of the groups that are at particular <laughs> risk of not going on are low-income students, first-generation attenders, so those are folks whose parents did not attend college or university, Aboriginal students, students with mental or physical disabilities, and students from some ethno-cultural and uh, racially diverse groups. So those particular groups we know, or we're hoping that there will be some uh, proposals by community groups to address those specific learning needs, because we know that uh, one size does not fit all in terms of program design. We wanted Abacus to provide a specific focus to disengaged and harder to reach students um, and their parents. 
one of the, so we, there are really two points in that particular bullet. One is that um, the, me the message from the Community Foundation Board was uh, we don't want to take, we don't want to focus on the students that are probably going to go to university anyway. Um, we want to do some of the heavier lifting that actually gets at the students that, that are at risk of not completing high school and not going to post-secondary attendance. So they wanted to reach a little bit deeper into the community. The second point in that bullet is the issue of parental engagement. And when you look at the literature around what kinds of things make a difference and whether or not a kid attends school, parental education and parental engagement is really the big factor. Um, it's, the, it's the one that really uh, lines up the closest when you look at correlation studies. But it also is one of the most difficult, uh, many of you out there have probably worked on some parental engagement initiatives, and it's difficult work. When we looked at the literature, there's very little uh, information about programs that um, are proven effective across jurisdictions. And again, uh, I think this is an area where the Community Foundation said, we know it's really important, we're going to try some things, we're going to find out what works, and then we're going to ramp it up. Um, so we wanted advocates to have a big focus on parents uh, and parental engagement. And then as Matt mentioned, um, a lot of the, f the feedback that we got was, was that there are structural barriers that need to be addressed that we can't do at the individual level and we can't do at the uh, individual school level that need to be a bit broader. So there will be some work done around that. a word about the middle school years. Um, when we were thinking about uh, places that we could focus abacus uh, on, there were several reasons that we chose the middle school years. Um, there is the looming transition to high school, which when we looked at the literature, there's a lot of evidence that says this is a key transition point for students. They, and if we can manage that successfully, they'll be successful uh, along the way. There's a lot of developmental changes taking place um, that are happening right in that grade 7, grade 8, which makes it a particularly vulnerable time for students. Um, students are making decisions about academic pathways and career uh, pathways that once on that road, it's very difficult to go back and change. And those happen in grade 7, grade 8. When we talk to a lot of you um, who are doing, doing early intervention work, one of the things we heard again and again was, well, you know, we're not sure we're getting there early enough. So a lot of these programs are starting in high school, and you're saying, boy, you know, there's a, there's a group of kids for whom uh, we're just not getting them early enough. And so that provides us some opportunity to get to develop some programs that can get there earlier. When we looked at the the community scan of, of services that are provided now, um, middle school years are among the least supported. So there's, uh, many of us will know that the Early Years Network and the Best Start Network have done incredible organizing and service provision work over the past decade in Hamilton. Um, the, the school boards have a very intensive uh, literacy program focusing on kindergarten and grade three to make sure that students are able to meet the literacy requirements by grade three been a major, major provincial policy push around um, student re-engagement and retention and student success that is in high school. Um, and relatively fewer uh, programs focus in on those middle school, school years, and very few organized policy agendas are focused on the middle school years. We did find it was interesting, it was really, um, I think, interesting to kind of look at that community scan and see that over 40 agencies that are providing some kinds of services to people, uh, to students in Hamilton. Um, some of those provide um, you know, one or two pillars. Some of them provide three pillars. Many of them are not um, providing the, the all four pillars. Um, and few of them are really focused in on the uh, on the middle school years. That's not to say all of them, but there there are relatively fewer there. So this is our diagram for Abacus. Um, the top row is what we're really going to be talking about today, and that's expanding and building on the existing community capacity through the granting stream. Um, Grad Track, Matt talked to you about. So that's the intensive support program that we're going to be launching over the fall. Um, and then the bottom tier there is supporting the systems change through convening uh, a, a table or a, a committee to work on those systemic issues. 
So I want to focus today on uh, the open call. Um, so I'm just going to delve into some of those characteristics a little bit more in detail. Um, really what we're trying to do is, through this granting round, is expand the available spaces and enhance the programming to, the, to support, better support the target groups. Um, when Matt was talking about encouraging systems and uh, community groups to reorganize and rethink the way that we're delivering systems, really this is around how, what is the best outcome for the student? How can we make sure that they're getting access to the four pillars that really um, have been demonstrated uh, to have a long-term impact on student success? We want to pilot new strategies for parental engagement, and we want to make sure that we're, um, while we're focusing on grades six through nine, six through eight with the transition to nine, that we're not then um, just leaving that transition to chance, that we're actually going to be working with them to ensure we build the bridge to supports in grade nine that, that exist. Or if they don't exist, we need to start having those discussions as well. So I want to touch base quickly, just go through a little bit more detail on what we're talking about with the four pillars. Um, the first one is academic upskilling. And this is really recognizing that for high school graduation and post-secondary attendance, there is an, an element of academic achievement that students uh, need to meet and that some students will require more support to do that than others. Um, and that support may look very different depending on the type of students that we're, that we're intervening with. Um, can mean after school homework programs, can mean computer literacy, can mean experiential learning, uh, or tutoring programs. But that academic skill upgrade is an important piece of what we want uh, programs to be addressing. The second pillar, mentoring. Um, you know, this falls back to when we hear a lot of, I remember doing some reading around um, at-risk youth and when you talk to at-risk youth about what made a difference in their lives, often they'll be able to point to one person and say, there was this counselor that believed this, there was this teacher that said that I could do it and I didn't know that I could do it. But there's a lot of evidence in the literature that mentoring and counseling uh, are a very important component of what makes uh, a successful program and that they, the emotional support um, and the ability to connect and mentor students is very important. So this could look like peer mentorship, after school recreation and arts programming. Again, where there's some kind of intent to develop a mentoring relationship, develop relationships so that that person can be supported all the way through. Uh, social skills development programs, one-on-one -on -one mentorship programs. So the, the third pillar that we want to talk about is goal setting. Uh, sometimes we talk about this as aspiration building. Um, when we were out talking to youth, um, one of the things that we heard again and again was that post-secondary uh, attendance was not something they felt like they belonged at. They, they said, I can't picture myself at McMaster University. I can't picture myself doing a post-secondary degree at Mohawk. Um, and that one of the things that the evidence tells us is if they don't think they're going to get there, it's going to be very difficult to get there. Uh, so one of the things that this pillar says is that we need to start introducing those aspirations early. We need to start um, talking about different post-secondary and trades paths. We need to give people exposure to the different kinds of careers and training opportunities that they are, whether it means spending time on a college campus or in a, in a dance studio or in a trades facility, um, and we need to engage parents in those discussions as well. One of the examples of how these pillars link together is that the research is fairly clear that simply providing information um, and then leaving it and, and, or introducing this goals, these goals um, does not necessarily result in change, but if you have a trusted source, a mentor, um, introduce this and support it, that is a much stronger effect on, on the likelihood that somebody's going to uh, attend post-secondary. One of the other things about uh, goal setting is providing timely information. So when you think about applying to post-secondary, um, and this is after middle, the middle school years, but in high school there are things like how do you apply for financial aid, how do you apply for, um, how do you actually do a college application, those kinds of things will be important down the road. But in the middle school years, there are huge choices being made about which course, which course they're going to follow, be it applied or academic or enriched uh, in school, and what are the impacts of that on their career. 
um, as well as financial literacy and planning. So even early on to be intervening with parents about um, what ways can post-secondary uh, attendance be financially viable, those are important conversations to have. And finally, the use of incentives. Um, one of the things that most of the programs that we looked at did was it included incentives to participate. So meal programs, bus tickets, program materials, um, all kinds of incentives to really provide a reward for students who uh, were able to meet the requirements of the program. And so one of the things that we're hoping that is, are built into the proposals that we get through the, the call um, is that uh, the, the inclusion of incentives. So ways of, of making the students um, and ways of recognizing their achievement, because I think that's what we're hoping that they do. So before I turn it over to Sharon, and we hear a little bit about more about the particulars of the actual grant application, I just wanted to kind of bring it back to the, the goal and the, our discussion of the, the four pillars and how we're hoping that, um, that the, mo the more pillars that can be built into applications, the better. What we found when we looked at the research really was that the best programs are able to offer four. That doesn't mean that we're asking everybody to have all four pillars, but it does mean that we need to think about how we're drawing those links together in order to have the best outcome for students. And then the final point around making sure that we're sensitive to the different subpopulations that exist and that we're taking not a one-size-fits-all approach, but that we're really uh, digging in and trying to figure out how to reach the kids that may not be coming to the programs already. Sharon? Hello, everybody. She's a booster. Uh, my name is Sharon Charters, and I'm the grants manager at the Hamilton Community Foundation. And I, as well, am very excited about uh, being part of this new initiative. And my job today is to kind of walk you through the logistics of applying. Mm -hmm. I'm not loud enough. <laughs> That's new. <laughs> That's very new. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so first of all, just to uh, go over briefly who is eligible to apply for grants uh, to the Hamilton Community Foundation. The foundation is limited to providing grants only to registered charities. But the other way that you can access funds if, if, if you are a nonprofit organization that has a partnership with a registered charity, and that's called a fiscal sponsorship arrangement. And there is a lot more information that has been provided by Canada Revenue on our website about what's involved in a fiscal sponsorship. And most of us will recognize kind of regular charitable, registered charitable organizations in the city, but also keep in mind that places like the school board, uh, like the city of Hamilton, most churches, for example, often have charitable status and um, may be willing to act as a fiscal sponsor for your project as well. The other thing around eligibility is that you cannot have any outstanding reports to the foundation. So if you've received grants from us before, just make sure that your reporting um, is up to date. And of course, that the work uh, must happen in Hamilton. So as Matt mentioned, um, the granting from Abaca for Abacus is from the discretionary funds held by the foundation. This is also, uh, you'll hear uh, it called the unrestricted funds. It's when people have made donations to the foundation and have really left it up to the board to make the decisions on how that uh, money is spent. Uh, for Abacus, the maximum grant will be $60,000. And while we anticipate that many of those grants will be for a one-year duration, we are also considering multi-year grants um, that could go up to three years. So the process for applying is a two-step process. Uh, first being the submission of a letter of intent 
and we're inviting those submissions for September the 16th. Those submissions will be reviewed and people that are successful at that step will be notified and asked to submit a full proposal uh, by October the 14th. Uh, just a reminder that we are very strict about these dates, so we cannot accept an application after that time period. And the other thing that I would point out to you is that it's a pretty tight time period. So what I anticipate is by the time the letters of intent come in, um, people will be notified within two weeks and would have about two weeks to then flush things out and submit their <coughs> full proposal. And then people will be notified of the decisions uh, by the end of December. Okay? So the letter of intent, I think, is, is quite simple and, and straightforward. Um, there's two pieces to it. One is just a cover page that asks for basic information about who you are, your organization. And then we ask that a narrative be attached to that. Uh, the narrative we've asked that you answer kind of the basic questions of who, what, where, when, and why. Um, and um, those questions are on our website. Um, so that's what would be included in the narrative portion of the letter of intent. There is no need to provide attachments at this stage of the process. So we're not asking for the audited financials or the list of your board of directors or that sort of thing. That will come at the full proposal stage. Uh, but at the letter of intent stage, it is not necessary. And we really ask that you limit the um, amount that you send us to a maximum of four pages. And that that be submitted in duplicate in hard copy. Uh, again, September the 16th being the deadline. So as I mentioned, once the decisions are made based on the letters of intent, uh, you will be notified in the application and you will receive an application form to be completed and then to be submitted with the required attachments by October the 14th. I just wanted to speak a little bit about some of the things that we will be looking for um, in the letter of intent and then the full proposals. And I would say most importantly is that there is a clear link to the overall goal of Abacus. So if you're running a sports program, that's great. It may be very appropriate for one of the other funds at the foundation. But unless there is a link between that program and keeping kids in school and encouraging them to go to post-secondary education, mm -hmm. then this is not going to be the fund that it's appropriate for. We are, as Matt mentioned, really looking for collaboration between organizations, between organizations and the school boards. Um, we're looking for coordination of services and realistic and measurable goals within the time period that's laid out. We also are looking for partners that are willing to work with us in terms of evaluating this initiative. Um, it's a new initiative for the foundation. We really want to find out what works. Um, so we ask that as well as evaluating individual programs that you be willing to work with us on a broader evaluation of Abacus as a whole. Um, as always, with all our applications, we're looking for a clear and uh, reasonable and justifiable budget. And I also wanted to point out to you, and you may have noticed this in the guidelines, that we're also using this as an opportunity to request proposals from organizations that are working on STEM initiatives. So STEM uh, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, uh, including the skilled trades in manufacturing. One of the reasons why we're including um, this is that 
Um, in addition to the Fairmount Foundation, we also have a good working relationship with ArcelorMittal de Fasco. And this is one of their areas of interest. So we hope to be able to possibly fund from Abacus, possibly fund from Arcelor funding within the foundation, or to at least share um, um, ideas with them because this is an area of interest for them. Uh, we're looking, as Jeff mentioned, about evidence of multiple pillars being incorporated in the initiative in the in the proposal and the target population of students be clear that it's addressing those high need populations uh, and a demonstrated need, particularly locally, what is the need in Hamilton and the rationale for whatever type of initiative or proposal that you are putting forward. And I have to include what's not going to be funded. Um, and those are kind of one-time events, um, programs that are the responsibility of the public through the Board of Education budget. Um, and what this is really referring to is programs that are already funded through the Board of Education, through their operating budget. We're looking at uh, doing things that are, are uh, new, innovative, building perhaps on existing programs, but not replacing um, already government-funded initiatives. We're not funding capital, um, which is not to say there may be small amounts of program capital within budgets, but not the focus of the initiative individual student sponsorships or bursaries, and of course, as always, any project made to promote political, religious, moral, or ethical philosophies that are deemed to be discriminatory. <coughs> if you're not sure if what you are doing fits with Abacus, please feel free to contact us, either by phone or by email, We'll do the very best that we can uh, to answer your questions. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to point out is um, after what you've heard today, if you end up thinking this really isn't the appropriate uh, proposal call for what we are doing, to keep in mind that the Hamilton Community Foundation holds many, many uh, different funds. and. Uh, if you have a, a, an interesting project, please share your idea with us. If it's not appropriate for Abacus, it may be very appropriate for one of the other funds that uh, we manage. <coughs>